Today, roughly half of all Christians believe that Jesus Christ will return to earth in their lifetime. The book of Revelation contains Jesus Christ's last words to the Christian church about the future. He warns of the terrible events that will fall upon the earth during the tribulation. What will happen to Satan, to the Antichrist, and to all who follow false religion. He tells what will happen at the Battle of Armageddon, his second coming to earth, his millennial kingdom, the final judgment, and describes what God has planned for his people in eternity future. In this series, we will take you chapter by chapter through the book of Revelation to help you understand its message and the future events God predicts are up ahead. Today, we start part three of this series, which we've entitled Armageddon, the Second Coming, and Eternity Future, Revelation chapter 14 through 22. My guests are Dr. Ed Heinsen, Dean of Liberty University's School of Religion and Distinguished Professor of Religion and the author of over 40 books. Dr. Mark Hitchcock is Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary. He's the author of 30 books on biblical prophecy and is the senior pastor of Faith Bible Church. Dr. Ron Rhodes also teaches at Dallas Theological Seminary and is president of Reasoning from the Scriptures Ministries. He's the author of 70 books on prophecy. Join us for this special edition of The John Ickerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg. Thanks for joining me today. We're talking about the important book of Revelation, okay? Jesus' last words to the church. And we're doing it with three great scholars, and we're going chapter by chapter, hoping to show you how important this information is. And Ed, bring us up to speed for the folks that are just joining us, maybe for the first time, of where we've come through the chapters and at what point we are in the book of Revelation right now. Okay, John, we started with chapter one, the preface to the book. Jesus appears to John on the island of Patmos, commissions him to write the book of the Revelation, which is a revelation from Jesus himself. Then secondly, we saw the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And then thirdly, we saw the problem that has to be resolved in the book, uh, the seven sealed scroll, someone who is worthy uh, of worship because he has divine authority, comes to take the scroll from the hand of God the Father, break the seals, pronounce the judgments, bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. And that's what we've seen going on in the book. The problem was solved because Christ, the Lamb, appeared. Uh, and then we began to see the seven seals and the judgments that followed them that were the wrath of the Lamb. Then we saw the seven trumpets uh, and the judgments that followed them. Then we stopped right in the middle of the book in chapters 12 and 13 and looked at seven symbolic players in this great end times drama as the book of Revelation defines itself. And now we move to the seven last plagues, uh, the bold judgments that are coming rapidly uh, at the time of the very end. When we come to chapter 14, uh, it's a preview of what's coming ahead. Uh, the fall of Babylon is announced in that chapter. In chapter 15, uh, the seven plagues are introduced as the angels come to take a bowl each and dip it into the greater bowl of the judgment of God. And then starting in chapter 16, the seven bowl judgments are then enumerated. And the text says, and in these, the wrath of God was filled up. So if you're left behind, you're under the wrath of the Lamb, the wrath of Satan, and now the wrath of God the Father. Jesus used this illustration about this time period being like a woman in labor. Explain how these events relate to that. Well, all of us who are fathers know what our wives went through in this big, big situation. The, the labor pains begin slowly, but they become more intense, more intense, and then more rapid, closer together, closer together, until the baby is finally delivered. What I think he's saying is these final results are coming, and they may start slowly, but then they'll increase with greater rapidity, 
faster and faster so that the final judgments, like the bowl judgments, seem to come literally one after another, uh, almost immediately one following the other. It's like one grand explosion that pushes the world light to the edge of the brink of extinction. Yeah, and Mark, you've said that there are little vignettes here that kind of give a preview of that. Name some of them. Yeah, it's like when you go to a movie and they kind of have the preview of upcoming movies and they show you what's coming. That's really what chapter 14 is. It's kind of just giving some little snapshots of what's coming. And I love the first one because it tells us that the 144,000 that we met all the way back in Revelation chapter 7 have been preserved now through the entire tribulation period. It's a scene of the millennial kingdom with Christ having returned. You say, well, why have that now at this point in the book? Well, because the previous chapter, chapter 13, was about the beast and the false prophet. And after reading that chapter, you could wonder, um, is man going to survive through this? And uh, you come and we see the lamb there with 144,000 showing that God is going to preserve them through this entire time. Uh, we read there in chapter 14, it gives us a preview of, of the doom of the followers of the beast. Those who followed him, they're going to be uh, cast in uh, to the lake of fire and they're going to be tormented there, it says, forever and ever. Um, it tells us about how God is going to rescue the righteous. It tells us about the doom of Babylon that's going to actually come in chapter 17 and 18. And then the chapter ends by talking about a great harvest of the earth that will take place, which I see as the bold judgments being poured out. And then finally, it pictures a great battle where the blood is going to be poured out up to the horse's bridle, which prefigures Armageddon, which we'll see uh, in chapter 19. So all of these really are just a prefiguring or kind of a preview of some of the key events that are coming uh, later in the book. Now, Ron, we've had this interlude here. We've been talking about the players, but now we get into these last bowl judgments that are really the anger of God coming on earth. All of these judgments now hit the entire world, okay? So this is really where the hammer comes down. What's the first bowl judgment? Well, things are bad enough as it is. Things are horrible by this point, but to add to the pain, the first bold judgment involves painful sores coming upon people. People are going to break out all over their bodies with painful sores, and it's going to be an infested kind of a sore that just won't get better. And Mark, what's the second bowl? You know, one of the things that's fascinating about the bowls, I might just mention this quickly, is there's a, there's a lot of parallels between these bowl judgments and the plagues of Egypt. Yeah, such towards. as? Well, you had Pharaoh back then who's saying, you know, who is God that I should serve him? It's kind of like we have Antichrist at the end saying the same thing. You know, who, who's the Lord? Who's God that I should serve? In fact, he makes himself to be God. You have a mention in, in uh, Revelation 15 of the Song of Moses, which alludes back to the Exodus. Uh, you have in, ex, in, in uh, Revelation 15 the Sea of Glass, whereas back in the book of Exodus you had the Red Sea. Uh, we have all these parallels. They're called plagues here, the seven plagues. There were 10 plagues. So we're really seeing God really going through and saying, you know, we have the same situation now we had back in Egypt. We had a man who claims to be God, um, who doesn't believe I'm the true God. It's like God is running through these same plagues uh, again, if you will. And uh, the second one of these bold judgments is the sea or the ocean turned to blood. Again, this is very similar to when the Nile River uh, was turned to yeah, blood. Yeah, no, this as well. is the entire ocean. Yeah, it's too. the entire ocean. So we know that these bowl judgments must be right near the end of the tribulation because life couldn't go on much longer uh, with the severity of these judgments that are coming. What's the next one? Yeah, well, if Jesus doesn't return, yeah, the planet is going to destroy itself. The people are going to destroy themselves. And interestingly to me, the seven bowl judgments land on basically the same objects as the trumpet judgments. Only the trumpet judgments affected one third of the planet. These affect all of the planet. The first one is on the earth, the second on the sea or the oceans, the third on the rivers or the fresh water, uh, the fourth again on the air and the sun, but the sun is burning through the atmosphere, through the ozone layer, scorching people. You almost get the idea again of some kind of nuclear thing going on that is literally destroying the environment of planet earth. Yeah. What's the next bold judgment? Well, the next one after that is darkness and pain comes upon the earth. In fact, it says this, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. You know, people only gnaw their tongues when they're in anguish. 
So this, this gives a picture of what people are experiencing. Yeah. Now, as we go into this last one, what takes place? Well, the, the sixth one of these bowls is really, it's, it's called Armageddon. And uh, that's a, a term that, you know, people use nowadays. It's kind of a, a term that's come into our common culture to just kind of mean the end of the world or anything bad that's taking place. And a lot of people don't realize that Armageddon is a literal place. I mean, it tells us here with the sixth bowl, the Euphrates River is going to be dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east to come in the land of Israel. Now, we don't know who the kings of the east are. They're plural. Uh, we know they have to come from east of the Euphrates River because obviously it has to be dried up uh, for them to come into that area. Uh, but it's going to be dried up, and these, these kings of the east are going to come into the land of Israel. And it seems they're coming into the land of Israel uh, to kind of once and for all destroy the Jewish people. But that's where the Antichrist is going to be gathered there, and he's going to be marshalling uh, his troops there kind of for this one uh, all-out war that will take place. But they'll be gathered there, and Armageddon is a literal place in the north of Israel. It's called Har Megiddo or the Mount of Megiddo. Um, it oversees a large valley that's 20 miles long, about 14 miles wide, that Napoleon called the world's perfect battlefield. And it's there that this final battle of the ages uh, will be waged. But in the middle of that, Jesus is going to come back from heaven, as we'll see over in Revelation 19. And that's going to be the end of these forces that are gathered there uh, in the land of Israel. All right, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, let's pick up and let's go to the Battle of Armageddon. And uh, it's a series of battles, why they take place, how many people are involved, what does Jesus do finally? So stick with us and we'll be right back. If you would like to have all of the information in our new series, The Last Words of Jesus, the book of Revelation, our nine television programs are available on three DVDs. These three DVDs are available for a gift of only $100. To order these DVDs, please call us at 1-800-805-3030. All right, we're back. We're talking with Dr. Ed Heinsen. We're talking with Dr. Dr. Mark Hitchcock and Dr. Ron Rhodes. And we're talking about something that almost everybody wants to know about. What is going to happen at Armageddon? Is Armageddon really going to happen? Is the whole world going to be involved in war? What does the Bible say? It's very interesting that there's only one spot here in the Bible that talks about Armageddon, and it tells you exactly what's going to happen. Ed, set this up. Well, as we come down to the end of those bold judgments, uh, the Scripture says that the armies of the world are converging on this place. Uh, the world is preparing for the last great final battle at a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon, it's the only place in the Bible where that name appears. Revelation chapter 16, verse 16. Everybody talks about Armageddon, thinks about it, worries about it, is concerned about it. It's only mentioned one time in the Bible. But that one time is dramatic because it's at that point you have that final bowl poured into the air. There's a massive earthquake uh, and the voice of God speaks from the throne of heaven and says, it is done. Uh, this is not what Jesus said from the cross when He died for our sins. It is finished. Your atonement is paid in full. That's not it. This is, this is the end. This is the final culmination of all the prophecies, of all the judgments. This is the end. And then the stage is set for the details about the fall of Babylon, about the return of Christ, and about what really happens at Armageddon. Okay, Mark, let's go into some of the finer details of these battles of Armageddon, which could be summarized as the Battle of Armageddon. Mm -hmm. Tell me what actually happens. You know, one thing I just want to mention real quickly, a lot of people take Armageddon symbolically. They'll say, you know, how do we know this is really talking about a real place? When you go back and think about the book of Revelation, John was on the island of Patmos. We take that literally. The names of the seven churches we take literally. So we have warrant in this book for taking this literally. It's a real place up in the northern uh, part of Israel. It's a, a, it overlooks a valley, uh, the Valley of Esdralon, the Plain of Esdralon, the Valley of Armageddon. 
Um, it, it's a, a, a literal place in northern Israel. So what's going to happen, I believe, is the Antichrist will gather his forces there. Uh, when we look at other places in Scripture, like Joel chapter 3, it says how God is going to uh, gather them there in the valley of Jehoshaphat and you know, this day of decision. Uh, many believe that's the, the Kidron Valley to the east of Jerusalem. So really this battle of Armageddon is going to extend throughout the entire uh, nation of Israel. Because remember at the end of chapter 14, it says the blood is going to go out to the horse's bridle for 184 miles, really, 185 miles, which is the entire length of the land of Israel. Right. So Israel, the entire land, will be engulfed in this battle, and all the armies of the earth will be gathered there. It mentions the kings of the east. The Euphrates River dries up for this uh, group of, of nations, this, this uh, coalition of nations from the east to come in. But it says it's all the nations of the earth that are going to be gathered there for this final great war of the ages. Question, will the American troops be there as well? Yes, I think if we take the scriptures literally, they will be. And that's a, a difficult thing for those of us who are Americans and love this country uh, to fathom. But uh, yes, after the rapture takes place, the believers are taken out of this world. Uh, America evidently too will, will turn its back on Israel and join kind of this great final thrust, if you will, by Satan of anti-Semitism to try to wipe out the Jewish people because I think he's going to know that Jesus is coming back soon. And so it's going to be kind of one all-out effort, one all-out anti-Semitic effort to kind of wipe out the Jewish people once and for all. But there's a big surprise with those nations when they're gathered there. Yeah, John, you know, that's another reason you don't want to be left behind. You could literally end up serving in the army of the Antichrist, opposing Christ himself, and be there when he returns, speaks the word, and slays the entire army of the Antichrist. And you remember what we said in the first chapter? We talked about Christ, and we learned some of the attributes of Christ, and he's got his penetrating vision in which he sees all things. Christ is watching all of this as it unfolds. And as these armies move against Jerusalem to destroy Jerusalem, Christ, with his penetrating gaze, sees all. And when they move against the, the, the remnant in the south, probably about 80 miles south, Christ is watching. And that leads up to the second coming of Christ. And in a very real way, we can consider that second coming of Christ to be a rescue mission because they cry out to the Lord, having been regenerated, having trusted in the Lord for the first time, having suddenly recognized that Jesus is, after all, the divine Messiah, that judicial blindness is removed from their eyes, and they know who Jesus is finally. And as they cry out to him, Christ returns, and he does indeed rescue them. You grew up in a liberal church I did. that did not believe in this, did not preach it, didn't want you to learn it. You weren't even a Christian. You're going to this church. How in the world did things change? Well, you know, I thought I was a Christian. I thought I was a Christian because I thought that going to church and being good and doing nice things in society made you a Christian. And they said that the second coming of Christ is when a person finds God again in their heart. That the Bible is inspired like Shakespeare is. It's inspiring to read. You see, so I didn't know any better. But I got excited about Bible prophecy. And actually, it was in Hollywood, of all places. I was there pursuing a Hollywood career, and I was doing a lot of the big national shows, like The Tonight Show, and Mer Griffin, and Dinah Shore, and all those others. And lo and behold, I was there working with Pat Boone and his family, and they were into Bible prophecy, which I had never heard of. I started to learn about the rapture, and the second coming, and the Antichrist, and what takes place during the tribulation period. And long story short, I ended up becoming a believer out of that, Soon thereafter, my brothers and sisters became believers. A few years later, my parents became believers. So God used Bible prophecy in a big way in my family. Well, let's continue the story. I just wanted people to hear that because there are a lot of folks that are sitting in churches where your pastor, for one reason or another, does not preach on Bible prophecy. So this may be the first time that you're hearing it and you're saying, does anybody else really believe that? Yes. There are, there are thousands and thousands of Christians all over the world that believe this. And the bottom line, it's in your Bible. You've got to read your Bible, and if you read it, you'll see what we're talking about. All we're talking about is what the Bible 
reveals, all right? And if God actually gave this, if Jesus actually wants us to know this, then you should want to know this and follow where this goes. All right, we're getting toward the end here. And uh, again, why is it that the Antichrist sends out some, some demonic representatives to gather the nations, the leaders together? What kind of a message could they say to bring them into the Holy Land? Well, there are signs and wonders that they do. They go out with lying signs and wonders again. You, they're seeing these miracles take place. Uh, but again, it could be that you know, we've got to w wipe out the Jewish people. Maybe it's because you know, they're the source of these things that are happening. Uh, the two witnesses we, heard, we, we talked about earlier, um, you know, Moses and Elijah come back calling these judgments down. The 144,000 Jewish representatives of the Lord have been out preaching. So it could be that, you know, the Jewish people are seen as this kind of thorn in the side. And if, if we can eliminate them once and for all, uh, then everything in the world's going to calm down. We don't know for sure, but some kind of lying message goes out to draw the world there to wipe out the Jewish people. Yeah. Wrap this up there, Ed. We've got yeah. about a minute left. And that is the fact is, there is a part of the Jews, two, two thirds reject and one third accept Jesus as being the Messiah that they had rejected before, but now they're all for him. They're in the wilderness. They're crying out to him, but you got this battle of Armageddon that's coming against them. They're out, man. They've got all the world against them. And then what happens? Jesus comes back. When Jesus returns, the Bible says that he comes with the sword of his mouth not weapons, guns, tanks, bombs. He speaks the word. He who spoke the world into existence at creation speaks, and the army of the Antichrist is eliminated, and the beast and the false prophet are cast alive into the lake of fire. You have the sovereign triumph of Christ at the end. He comes back from heaven and brings with him, as we'll see next time, those that have been taken to the marriage in the rapture. The church is no longer the church rejected, persecuted, maligned. Now she is the church triumphant, marching out of heaven with her warrior husband in victory at the Battle of Armageddon. And yet it's a battle in which there virtually is no battle. He's the one who's in charge. He's the one who speaks the word. He's the one who wants to speak into your heart, into your soul, and into your mind, and says to you, come unto me, and I will give you rest. Yeah. And folks, the Bible also says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He does the saving, but he waits for you to ask him to save you. You got to recognize and admit that you're a sinner. You have to believe that Jesus actually did die for your sin. And if you ask him, he will come into your life and he will forgive you and he will change you. And then all these events, the bad events, the tribulation, you won't be a part of any of that because you'll be taken out in the rapture before it. So I hope that you'll say that prayer to the Lord right now, right now, before anything gets in the way, and ask the Lord to come into your life. If you mean it, He will do it right now. Guys, I want to say thank you for coming. I want to say thank you for all the study, for the time, breaking into your busy, busy schedules. And uh, folks, if you'd like to know how to get all the information that they've been teaching you all through these series, stay tuned and we'll tell you about how you can do that right now. If you would like to have all of the information in our new series, The Last Words of Jesus, the Book of Revelation, our nine television programs are available on three DVDs. Our first DVD covers Revelation 1 through 6 and is titled, The Glorified Jesus Reveals the Future. Our guests describe Jesus' appearance to John and his commission to him to write the book of Revelation. John then writes letters to the seven churches and is taken up to the throne room of God where he sees Jesus open seven seals that rain down different judgments on earth. Our second DVD contains three more programs that cover chapters 7 through 13, which we have titled, The Judgments and Main Players of the Tribulation. Here, we learn about the seven trumpet judgments. As a result of the seal and trumpet judgments, half of the world's population will die. We'll then discover the main players in the tribulation, 
including a woman, a child, and a dragon who symbolize Israel, Jesus, and Satan. We are told about the Antichrist, the false prophet, the mark of the beast, and 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Our third DVD is entitled Armageddon, the Second Coming and Eternity Future and covers Revelation chapters 14 through 22. Here we learn about the seven horrible bowl judgments and the battle of Armageddon. Jesus will defeat his enemies at his second coming and set up his millennial kingdom on earth. This will be followed by God's final judgment and a description of the new heaven and earth for believers. And finally, we are also offering our new book entitled the most asked prophecy questions, what the Bible says about end times and why it matters today. This 121 page book will give you a clear picture of the last days. It contains concise biblical answers to your challenging questions about the signs, timelines, and mysteries of Bible prophecy. And you may order this book for a gift of $15. And if you would like to have all of these materials, including all nine TV programs on three DVDs, plus the new book, they are available together in a special package for $110. To order these three DVDs and the new book, please call us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. 3030. And you may call that same number any day this week, 24 hours a day. Or if you wish, you may give your gift at our website at jashow.org, where we have a secure place for you to give your gift. And then those of you who live in Canada may call us at 1-866-746-5803. That's 1-866-746-5803. 5803. And our Canadian website is jashow.ca. And when we receive your gift, we will send you a receipt and a personal thank you. Finally, keep in mind that all of our TV programs are available online as digital downloads at our website at jashow.org or jashow.ca. This program is sponsored by the John Ankerberg Show Ministries and is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.